Story recapped here. Today I'm going to explain a drama, horror, mystery, and thriller film called The Unborn. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. On her daily jog during a chilly day, Casey Belden, a young woman in her 20s, notices a glove lying on the road. From behind, she notices a young boy with bright blue eyes staring blankly at her, with one glove missing from him. The boy suddenly becomes a masked dog, which Casey follows to the woods. It leads her to a pile of dried leaves, where the mask lies, so she digs to find out what lies below and sees a fragile fetus who opens its bright blue eyes. Casey wakes up and realizes that the incident is only a dream, so she consults her best friend, Romy, who is very superstitious and spiritual. According to Romy, dreaming of a baby is a symbol of change and renewal, while dreaming of a dog is weird since dogs, in mythology, are often seen as messengers of the dead. However, Casey does not seem bothered by this and laughs the topic off. During the night, she is on babysitting duty for the Newton family's young boys. She hears footsteps from upstairs and hears someone from the baby monitor saying, look in the mirror, some people are doorways. Alarmed by this, she calls for the kids and heads upstairs to check upon them. She sees Maddie, the older boy, showing his baby brother its reflection with a mirror while whispering phrases to him. When Casey calls Maddie's attention and demands him to stop, he attacks her by smashing the mirror directly on her head before telling her, Jumbie wants to be born now. The parents eventually arrive at the house, and Casey tells them about the incident. The mother, Gail, insists on having Casey checked up at the hospital, but she says that everything is fine. Before leaving, she sees Maddie still staring intently from upstairs, so she hurriedly leaves. Outside, she stumbles upon the same glove that she dreamt about, which weirds her out. When she arrives home, she greets her dad, Gordon, and says goodnight after her long day. After getting ready for bed, she turns off her bathroom lights and hears noises coming from the medicine cabinet. She turns the lights on and opens it, but there is nothing there, so she disregards it. While Casey sleeps, the knocking noises from the medicine cabinet continue as if something is on the other side. The following day, Casey makes her breakfast, and a giant insect comes out of the egg she cracks, putting her in a state of shock. As she rinses off the skillet, she sees Maddie, the boy she babysat, from their kitchen window just standing still. Already disturbed by the reoccurring sight of the little boy, she tells Romy, her boyfriend, Mark, and their other friend Lisa, about it. Mark defends the kid by saying that Maddie doesn't know what he is doing, while Romy warns Casey that showing an infant a mirror is bad luck. Myths say that newborns aren't supposed to see their reflection until they are a year old, which means that they will die soon. Mark is unconvinced and makes a joke out of it. While she attends class, Casey gets phased again and starts seeing the phrase Jumbie wants to be born now on the blackboard and in her notebook. She tries to focus and snap out of her hallucinations, but she sees the same insect land on her hand, causing her to walk out of class. She takes a shower to help clear her mind, but she couldn't help but be bothered by what is happening around her. Shortly after, Romy has a conversation with Casey in the locker, but she realizes that her eyes are changing in color. Feeling alarmed, Casey seeks a doctor who tells her that the condition is heterochromia, meaning one iris is a different color than the other. He explains that it is usually congenital. It may occur after blunt trauma or an indication of malignant melanoma. To be sure, the doctor takes pictures of her eyes and inserts speculums to keep her eyelids open. On their way out, Casey thanks Mark for accompanying her and says that he could stay the night at her place. In the busy streets, she sees the pale blue-eyed boy from her dream once again, but he disappears in a split second, leaving her confused. That night, both of them cuddle in bed while talking about life, death, and the afterlife. The topic shifts to Casey's deceased mother, Janet, whom she last saw in a mental institution as a kid. She remembers seeing her mother, who also had heterochromia, in such a sad state, looking like she had given up already. To this day, Casey still holds a grudge against her mother for leaving her and her father. Before going to bed, Casey checks her eye condition in the mirror and hears the knocking sounds from the medicine once again. She checks, but again, nothing is there, so she heads back outside. For the second time, she hears noises and returns to the medicine cabinet, where she opens it and sees the pale boy. Her screams alarm Mark, who comes to find her in the bathroom frightened. To avoid any further encounters, Casey takes down her medicine cabinet permanently. On one of her routine runs, Casey hears a commotion in the neighborhood, specifically in the Newton home. Curiously, she asks another neighbor about it, to which she replies that the baby stopped breathing. She sees the devastated Gail reach out to her deceased baby, who is being carried out on a car. Weirdly enough, she also sees Maddie sitting by the window, either clueless or unaffected by the whole situation. Back at the doctor's office, her doctor asks if she has a twin, to which she replies that she is an only child. If she had, it would explain why her eye colors are different because of genetic mosaicism. When dealing with twins, the placentas become fused, and a certain amount of blood would be exchanged back and forth, causing the different pigmentation in her iris as a result of a foreign genetic strand. However, the doctor assures her that her eyes are healthy, but she could consider seeing a genetic counselor. Troubled by her thoughts, Casey seeks answers from her father right away while he is at work. She immediately asks if she has a twin, to which he replies that she was supposed to have a twin brother, but sadly he died while still in the womb because Casey's umbilical cord suffocated him. 
Taken aback by this, she asks him if it was the reason for their mother taking her own life, but he strongly denies her claim. Gordon tells Casey that although the pregnancy was too early for the twins to have names, they did give nicknames, with Casey's twin brother being Jumpy. Shocked to hear this, she simply breaks into tears and heads home, where she scours through family memoirs. She finds a film reel and a newspaper article about war survivors with the name Sophie Cosma underlined. She also sees a picture of her pregnant mother looking at her reflection in the mirror, with the boy just behind her. To learn more about her twin and her mother, Casey and Romy go to a nursing home to visit Sophie Cosma. From the hallways, they are greeted by Sophie herself, who seems to be a very welcoming woman. In her room, Casey notices a spot in the wall where it used to have a mirror, and Sophie says that she had it removed because it bothers her. Without further discussions, Sophie immediately asks Casey if she had a twin as she senses it in others because she used to have one herself. When Casey hands the old lady the article, she sees the same red bracelet she saw on her mother the day she passed. Casey also asks Sophie if she knows her mother by any chance, but Sophie says she doesn't. To be sure, Casey shows her the picture she retrieved from her home. When the old lady sees the boy in the picture, it frightens her and orders Casey and Romy to get out at that instant. The old lady's behavior puzzles the two girls, and they discuss the incident in the parking lot. Romy tries to calm Casey, who is highly paranoid about Sophie hiding something from her. She reveals that since the night she babysat the Newtons, she has been seeing things and thinks that she is being haunted by someone who was never born. With the help of Mark, they use a projector to play the film she retrieved from her mother's things and examine its contents. Both of them see nothing strange about the film except for the fact that the place shown is the hospital where Casey's mother took her own life. To forget all about it for a while, they decide to go to a club and party the night away. However, Casey is still unable to escape her visions and sees the boy's face among the people in the club. Still phased, she goes to the bathroom to freshen up but ends up throwing up in the toilet where she sees a vandal of an eye. It grabs her attention, making her look through it when insects and blood pour out. She quickly runs outside, but the door is locked, and the insects and blood start appearing from the bathroom sink, and fingers start coming out from the walls, rendering the situation in complete chaos. Casey freaks out, and from one of the bathroom stalls, her mother appears, reaching out for her while calling her name. Her friends come to her rescue and comfort her until she calms down. After the disastrous night, Casey dials Romy through a video call to ask her for some advice. She tells her best friend that she saw her mother and expresses her worries about ending up in the same fate as her. The superstitious Romy instructs her to put a pair of scissors under her pillow with the two points open. She learned this from her grandmother to keep evil spirits away. Desperate for some peace of mind, Casey grabs a pair of scissors and puts them under her bed, as instructed by Romy. This is proven ineffective as Casey sees herself floating from the ceiling, watching herself sleep. Deeply panicked, she sees the boy beside her in bed, opening her stomach to put himself in. She screams and wakes up from the nightmare to answer a phone call from Sophie, who apologizes for their recent meeting. On the phone, Sophie tells her to come back to the nursing home and reveals that she is actually Casey's grandmother. Still dark out, Casey makes her way to the nursing home and meets with her grandmother, who reveals that the boy in the reflection is her twin brother, Bardo, who died in 1944. With a collection of pictures, she recalls the time that they were both captives of war. The military thought that examining twins could unravel the mysteries of genetics, so they conducted numerous experiments on the twins they have captured. Among the cruel experiments they made was fabricating blue eyes from brown through painful eye injections. The experiments caused blindness, and even worse, death, a fate that Bardo ended up in. However, Bardo arose from the dead after two days, but she claims that it was not really him. A doorway has been opened, and something else inhabited his boy, a dibuk. It is a dead person's soul that is barred from entering heaven, causing it to endlessly wander around the world of the living and the dead, trying to find a new body. Since twins are mirrored images of each other, they are highly considered as doorways between the different worlds. According to Sophie, she killed the spirit that took over her brother, but it is endlessly trying to come back into her life since then. The entity tried to take hold of Casey's unborn twin, and when it failed to have him, it turned its gaze to Casey. Ever since Casey was born, the spirit has been circling her life, waiting for the perfect moment to enter. Desperate to get rid of it, Casey asks Sophie how, and her grandmother talks about a book of mirrors, a compilation of rites of exorcism, and refers Casey to a rabbi named Joseph Sendak, who could be of great help. Once Casey gets a hold of a copy of the book, she visits Rabbi Sendak, and asks him if he could read the book written in Hebrew. He explains that the book is derived from the Kabbalah, which is a form of Jewish mysticism. Moments later, Casey informs him that she needs an exorcism immediately performed on her. He brushes the topic away by saying that spirits aren't real. He also adds that what she is asking is beyond his expertise as he has never performed an exorcism in his career. She desperately asks the rabbi to help her as her life depends on it, but he doesn't promise her anything. As per Sophie's advice, Casey keeps the protective necklace given to her, gets rid of all the mirrors in their home and puts up chimes to indicate if a spirit is near. Meanwhile, Romy drives to meet at Casey's house when she runs over Maddie, who is on his bike. In a state of panic, she gets out of her car to the boy, but to her surprise, Maddie stands up as if he hadn't been hit by a car. He then tells Romy in a very menacing way, he doesn't like you helping her before warning her that if she keeps being around Casey, then he will kill her. As Romy arrives at Casey's house, she explains what happened and notices that her eyes worsen by the day. 
Concerned, she asks Casey if she is okay and that she will always stay beside her as her best friend. Later that night, Casey finds herself in front of her mother, but she transforms into something far from natural. She realizes that it is just a dream and hears the chimes from downstairs, signaling that a spirit is near. At the same time in the nursing home, Sophie cannot sleep after hearing wind chimes and tries to turn on the lamp on her bedside, but to no avail. She makes her way downstairs with a flashlight and hears wailing noises from a distance. In the dark hallway she notices Eli, the paralyzed man who also resides in the nursing home, is awake. Not paying much mind to him, she goes downstairs and sees Eli below the staircase, crawling on all fours as if he is possessed. His head eerily turns around his neck, and he chases her endlessly down flights of stairs. Struggling to move, she finds a closet where she could hide, but behind her, the boy appears, making her scream out of fear. At daybreak, Casey visits the nursing home but senses that something is amiss by the number of authorities present. Making her way upstairs, she eventually sees her grandmother lying lifeless on the floor. Another patient hands her a letter, which should be given to Casey if something might happen to her. In the letter, her grandmother tells her that Casey's mother lost and gave in to the Dibuk. She also writes that it feeds on fear and will isolate her from her friends and family. Meanwhile, at the rabbi's office, the power shuts down for unknown reasons, so he grabs a flashlight and makes his way down the stairs. At the altar, he sees a growling dog with its head upside down. He bravely shouts at it to go away from the place, and in a matter of seconds, it disappears. On the video call, Casey and Romy talk about how Casey should not worry about the spirit and that her grandmother's death may be natural. Casey says it isn't and that the spirit will hurt everyone she loves, and they will get her when she is helpless. Romy hears her doorbell ring and leaves her room to check despite Casey's protest not to answer it. While Romy is not in her room, she catches a glimpse of the boy in Romy's mirror, so she calls Mark and tells him to meet her at Romy's house without any explanation. The lights go out at Romy's house as well, and when she checks the front door, Maddie stands while saying, the doorway is open. The little boy stabs her right after saying the phrase, making her run upstairs while he devilishly follows her. Just as Casey and Mark break a glass door, Maddie's face transforms into something else, and she finds Maddie standing by Romy's body. As a reflex, Mark pulls the kid away, grabs the knife from him, and is about to attack the boy when Casey stops him because the spirit has transferred to Romy's body. She twitches around and disfigures her body before authorities arrive at the scene. The following day, Rabbi Sendak brings Mark and Casey to a basketball court where they are introduced to coach Arthur Wyndham, who is also a priest that could help them. To perform the exorcism, the venue should be at a place that is negative to Casey, so she opts to be at the mental institution where her mother lived her remaining days. Other volunteers come along who are willing to help as the specific exorcism would require 10 people. All of them get informed about the methods and the equipment that they will use during the procedure. She lays down in the middle of the now sacred circle while the others utter the biblical phrases. Moments later, strong winds storm the entire room while the participants start getting possessed right before dying on the spot. Casey moves frantically and gets visions of all the traumatic incidents that occurred during the past days, all while the boy is standing beside her. The whole room gets trashed in the boy's presence, so Mark decides to run away with Casey, who is in the most danger. In the middle of the chaos, the boy approaches Father Arthur and decides to take over his body. The priest chases the couple around the dim hallways of the asylum, but they manage to hide in a small space. Unfortunately, the priest grabs Mark from the other side of the wall, and the two of them fight, resulting in Mark being able to bring him down. A bit relieved, she realizes that the spirit has transferred to Mark's body, so she runs away from him, but he gets a hold of her and strangles her against the wall. Casey uses the protective necklace from Sophie to stab Mark's neck, and he drops her. For rescue, the rabbi comes in and continues to read rites from the book along with Casey. Mark's body twitches around as the spirit is slowly defeated, making him blast back to the first floor of the building. The sight of it shatters Casey, and she comes beside him as he bids his final goodbye. Days have passed, and the chaos has subsided for a while. Noticing some symptoms, Casey takes a pregnancy test and consults a doctor, finding out that she is pregnant with twins, and once again feels a sense of deja vu. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.